Late breaking news as we come on the air tonight. A federal judge ordering the release of children being held with their parents at three family detention centers here in Texas and in Pennsylvania. The judge's order applies to children held for more than 20 days. Those detention centers are operated by the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and some of those families have been held since last year. The judge cited the recent spread of the coronavirus in two of the three facilities as a cause for the change. The facilities have a deadline of July 17th for children to either be released with their parents or sent to family sponsors. For more details, head to our website, ksat.com. Another late breaking news story tonight, a Bear County Sheriff's deputy who mentioned killing rioters and looters has been given a proposed termination. Deputy Justin Silva under investigation since early this month after making the now deleted controversial Facebook post. Silva previously had his peace officer's license withdrawn, was ordered to turn in his badge and credentials. Confirmation of Silva's proposed termination comes the same day. Sheriff Javier Salazar warned rank and file deputies that, quote, everything we post online is being scrutinized by the whole world right now. End quote. The Bear County Sheriff's Office confirming tonight a deputy is on a ventilator battling COVID-19. Yeah, this is another dangerous milestone was reached when it comes to patients on ventilators. There are 405 new COVID-19 cases in Bear County tonight. The total confirmed cases now sitting at 8,857. One new death tonight, bringing the total to 105. More than 5,000 people are still ill. 699 people are in the hospital. That's an increase of 71 since yesterday. 221 are in the ICU. That's up by 19. And 117 people are on ventilators. This marks the first time those patients have surpassed 100. Bed capacity right now is at 26%. As COVID-19 cases in Bear County continue to climb, putting nearly 700 people in the hospital and more than 100 on ventilators, like you just heard, state and local governments are clamping back down. The governor announced today that bars across Texas must close again, as do tubing outfitters and restaurants can only operate at half capacity. But the governor not the only one taking action. Garrett Berger tells us about the return of the restrictions. The governor's rollback on restrictions didn't surprise Mayor Ron Nurnberg. We knew we were opening too fast. And while the mayor or county judge don't have much power anymore to make local restrictions, they are taking action where they can. City pools and splash pads won't have a limited reopening as planned next week. And whereas the city and county already announced no gatherings of more than 100 people outdoors, there will now be less in some spaces starting tomorrow. We will prohibit gatherings of more than 10 people uh, in any city, public, uh, county, park, or plaza. That could affect protests like the one planned for Columbus Park tomorrow. Asked about enforcing these gathering restrictions when many are taking to the streets, the mayor said this. You know, we are going to uh, kindly ask people to think about the pandemic that we're in and to disperse. Nuremberg said they'll be stepping up enforcement of the mask order for businesses too, which has been in effect since Monday. We're not going to wait for calls anymore, so please, uh, if you're patronizing a business or you're running a business, ensure that you're complying with the mask order uh, because we are going to step up enforcement to make sure that uh, we, can, we can again contain the spread of this virus. The mayor says he spoke with Governor Greg Abbott today too, who acknowledged this is a dynamic situation. To Nuremberg, things needed to be rolled back. And I don't think anybody wants to go back to a stay home order if we can avoid it. And we can avoid it by doing the things that the public health professionals are telling us will we'll get a handle on this virus. Gary Berger, KSAT 12 News. More than 300 complaints were made this week on businesses that weren't complying with the new face mask order. No citations have been issued so far, only warnings. But the night team's Patty Santos reports businesses who continue to ignore those warnings could face a $1,000 fine. Where people are struggling right now is when they get up to go to the bathroom. Randy Stokes, owner of Barn Door Restaurant and Meat Market, says about 98% of his customers have willingly helped them comply with the mandatory face mask order. Uh, we had a husband and wife walk out because he swore he was not a mask on. Uh, we knew that would happen. He says the hardest part for business owners has been training staff to remind customers to wear them. I think after about 10 days, people will get used to wearing their mask very religiously. It'll become habit. That's the hope for the city of San Antonio as well. We're seeing a high, high uh, 
number of businesses that are complying. Michael Shannon, the Development Services Director, says they've had about 100 calls daily since the mask order took effect Monday, up from about a dozen since businesses reopened. When we get those calls, we send a code officer or one of the city staff out to investigate to see if there is any violation of the orders. So far, his dozen compliance officers have only been educating businesses. No citations have been written yet related to the recent phase mask mandate. You know, we'd rather not give a citation. We, we would just really want to you know, get people into compliance. Certainly with the new rules after a warning, uh, if they're still out of compliance and we have to go back, uh, then that might be something we have to issue a citation. Since March, the city of San Antonio has issued 67 citations related to the public health emergency declaration. A fine could cost up to $1,000 per violation. You can call 210-207-SAPD to report a violation. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. Bear County officials are holding another mask distribution tomorrow. It's part of their goal to give away 1 million masks to local businesses. Those who wanted to receive masks had to pre-register, and so far, 1,600 businesses are registered for tomorrow. The mask distribution will be at Bibliotech South off Pleasanton Road from 7.30 to 2.30. Each business will get a supply of 100 masks while supplies last. The former head of Metro Health will now be leading the coronavirus fight. This comes after the resignation of Metro Health Director Don Emmerich. In addition to her job as assistant city manager, Colleen Bridger will also serve as interim Metro Health Director. She was set to leave her position at the city manager's office in July, but has decided to hold off her resignation until the director position is filled. Emmerich's resignation comes five months after starting the job. In her resignation letter, she asked the city replace her with a person of color. Emmerich's last day with the city will be July 3rd. Well, it's as simple as picking up the phone. That's all it takes, according to Metro Health officials, when it comes to contact tracing COVID-19. Around 70 workers and some volunteers are making the calls. Contact tracing is how Metro Health finds out where the virus is spreading, who's infected, and how many have recovered. The calls will come from a 210-207 phone number. It can last anywhere between 15 to 45 minutes, depending on the case. Metro Health is asking for your help to track COVID-19. It's important for individuals to answer their phone when we call, that way we're able to gather the information and provide a complete investigation. When people do not answer our phone calls, that information is lacking and we may be missing um, educating individuals that may be at risk. Metro Health has also contracted a third party calling service to help reach more residents. A determined doctor and university health systems wants everyone to wear a mask. So much so, they did a demonstration today with that doctor, Senior Vice President Dr. Tommy Austin, who voluntarily was placed on a ventilator. She says it was all to show how important it is to wear masks. It really impacted all of us because it made us think, well, what if that's my coworker in that bed? How would I feel about if I was the one who gave it to that person because I was selfish enough not to wear a mask around them, knowing that that could help prevent the spread of this disease? She did it all live on Facebook. We spoke to Dr. Tommy Austin about that experience and what she hopes people will get out of it. You can see that interview later in the show in our KSAT Q&A segment. A blow to Texas Democrats over mail-in voting. Today, the U.S. Supreme Court rejected an effort by the party to allow all voters in the state to vote by mail. Currently, Texas allows absentee voting only for those who are out of state, have a disability, or are age or are over age 65. Texas GOP officials are against it, citing the potential for fraud. Democrats argued that people shouldn't have to choose between their right to vote and their health. The battle over how our elections will be conducted was the focus of this week's episode of KSAT Explains. That's our new weekly digital news program that aims to offer perspective to the stories that we bring you throughout the day. For this episode, Myra Arthur talked to the Bear County's elections administrator about the precautions her department is taking to prepare for in-person voters. We've spent a lot of time getting the PPE, so the election officials will have I think they call them sneeze guards, those big plastic. We'll put those on the qualifying tables. Um, we're getting the masks and face shields, gloves, uh, hand sanitizer. 
Hand sanitizer will be available at all polling sites. Voters will also be able to use plastic gloves to touch the voting machines or pencils. You can use the eraser as a stylus to make your selections. Voters should also take steps on their own to stay healthy. Here's the checklist that the state of Texas encourages people to follow when voting. Self-screen before you go out to vote. If you have any COVID-19 symptoms, you might want to consider curbside voting if you're eligible. Stay six feet away from others. Wear a mask, but be prepared to remove it if an elections judge needs to confirm your identity. You can put it back on once they're done. This pandemic has impacted not only how we vote, but also polling sites themselves. Bear County has removed about three polling locations due to the coronavirus. We normally are at the Justice Center. Well, we can't be there because the state Supreme Court has said that anyone going into a county building that's holding court or having a hearing, they have to have their temperature checked and they have to wear a mask. And we can do neither of those mandates for a voter. Another way to minimize risk or exposure, vote early on a Tuesday, a Wednesday or Thursday when the polls usually see less traffic. Early voting in the July runoff elections begins on Monday. You can watch KSAT Explains Mail-In Voting on demand right now on the KSAT TV app. It's available on most smart TV devices or at ksat.com slash explains. A developing story at this hour. A man in critical condition following a shooting on the northeast side today. It happened about 630 in an apartment complex parking lot off Perrin Central Boulevard. San Antonio police say an altercation escalated between two men when one of them pulled out a gun. The 41 year old victim shot twice in the stomach. He was transported to Bamsey with life threatening injuries. No arrests have been made. You're still ahead on the night beat. Texas, not the only state putting a stop to the reopening phase. How other hot spot states are trying to curb the spike in COVID-19 cases. And large gatherings may be banned, but that doesn't mean Pride Month celebrations can't go on. We'll show you how the show is planning to still continue. But next, it's been a month since George Floyd died in police custody. See the policy changes being made, not just in Minneapolis, but around the nation. The gears of a cultural shift seem to be turning in America, sparked largely by the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis more than one month ago. The city of Minneapolis is now making big moves to eliminate its police department, but it doesn't stop there. Nadia Romero has the latest. We saw injustice with our own eyes. Georgians protested to demand action, and state lawmakers, many who are gathered here today, rose to the occasion New hate crime legislation is now law in Georgia. After Ahmaud Arbery, a 25-year-old black man out for a jog, was shot and killed in February. House Bill 426 criminalizes acts of hate targeting the victim's race, religion, sexual orientation, and mental and physical disability. This bipartisan legislation is a powerful step forward. It's a sign of progress. In Minneapolis, more than a month after the death of George Floyd, the city council unanimously voted to kickstart the process to eliminate the city's police department and create a new department providing community safety and violence prevention. The first step could lead to voters making the final call this November. This is one action of many that we need to take on this road to a more equitable and just system that keeps people safe. And in Aurora, Colorado, the governor has reopened the investigation into the death of Elijah McClain, a 23-year-old black man who died Stop. in police custody Stop. after he was right. placed Stop. in a chokehold and paramedics Roll. injected Roll. him Roll. with the powerful Roll. sedative Roll. ketamine. Last fall, we called for an independent investigation into the murder of Elijah McClain. And what did we hear then? Crickets. So, you know, on the one hand, they're very happy that people are paying attention now. I'm Nadia Romero reporting. A viral video allegedly involving several Alamo Heights high school students is forcing the district to respond. In the video, one of the teens used a racial slur. People have reposted the video on social media asking the district to take action. The district said there will be consequences. It released this statement saying in part, quote, racial slurs and posting racial slurs online shows a lack of understanding regarding the pain and hate that language like that causes. Its use calls us as a community and as a district to commit to action and education around diversity, 
equity and inclusivity, end quote. Organizers are taking this year's Pride Festival to a screen near you with a virtual celebration. That virtual celebration is going to happen tomorrow. The Pride Bigger Than Texas Virtual 2020 Celebrate Pride 365 Festival will feature several performers, including Tejano and pop singers and drag artists. Organizer James Poindexter says this event is more than just about entertainment. Panelists will discuss the recent Supreme Court decisions that have affected the LGBTQ plus community as well as the Black Lives Matter movement. We felt that we really owed it um, to our community to be able to discuss those things and to provide a little bit of insight into what's going on in that regard. The virtual pride celebration will raise money for local nonprofits and charities. It's happening tomorrow. It starts at 6 p.m. You can find the link to watch on our website, ksat.com. Meantime, let's take a live look outside with live cam 77 degrees out there. It's an interesting day, a wet day, pretty much all day. Today. Yeah, you do, and muggy. Yeah. Yes, oh my gosh, humid as all get out, but we got some good rain today. Yeah. It was cloudy, our high temperatures limited to the mid 80s. At some at one point I was like, is it late June? I was really confused, <laughs> uh, but we were very happy to get the rain. In and around San Antonio in Bear County, most spots received between a quarter and a half inch of rain, but the sweet spot today, uh, that was down closer to the coast from Live Oak into B County, 1.37 inches. Measured in Beeville, Carnes County doing pretty good, almost up to two inches of rain there. Uh, and then a nice little swath of some rain into Gonzales County. But then as you got closer and closer to I-10 Highway 90, those rainfall totals really did start to drop off. And if you were west of 35, rain was actually really hard to come by today. But here's a look at today's time lapse. A very gray day. If you never stepped outside, you may have thought it was kind of uh, cool or chilly out there. But it was certainly warm, certainly very muggy. 85 today during the 3 o'clock hour. That's when we briefly saw that cloud cover pick up a bit. Saw a little bit of sunshine that pushed us up to 85. But really, we spent most of the day today in the 70s. That will not be the case this weekend. We're flipping the switch back to more summer like weather across the board this weekend. Mornings in the 70s, very humid, hot and humid in the afternoons with high temperatures in the low to mid 90s the next couple of days. And I also think you'll be able to notice a bit more of a haze on the horizon, uh, especially tomorrow as we see some more sunshine. That's a hair and dust we've been talking about all week was in the air today. It was just harder to see it because of the cloud cover and the rain. I do think it will be more noticeable, though, as we get into the weekend. So keep in mind that Saharan air layer is present over South Texas. As for this evening, we saw a little lull in the rainfall, but now another batch of showers moving in from the south has brought some of our communities west of 35. A little bit of rain this evening there from La Prior 83 all the way over to the border there north of Eagle Pass. A little bit of shower activity there and some showers trying to sneak up the uh, I-37 corridor and even here in Bear County, far south Bear County, 281-1604 there just south of Mitchell Lake. A little shower darting off to the north that will be approaching 410 and a few lucky yards could get a little bit of drink from this shower moving through tonight. So let's look at future cast. It is picking up on some of the shower activity that we have out there tonight generally continues to bring it north and fizzle it out through the course of the overnight hours, but I'm going to leave in a chance of an isolated shower tonight through early tomorrow morning, and you'll see through the course of the day on Saturday a persistent 20% chance of an isolated shower or non-severe storm. I think as we get into the afternoon, we'll see some more sun, but that could help to pulse up a few little isolated downpours tomorrow, and some of our models are also uh, also, excuse me, starting to pick up on some more showers developing about this time tomorrow night. So we'll leave in a 20% chance of an isolated shower tomorrow. Now, as we get into Sunday, I actually think that's when we have a slightly better chance to see a few more thunderstorms especially in the afternoon and evening hours because we'll have a nice little piece of upper level energy dropping down on Sunday here off to our northwest and that should help to generate a little bit more lift. So that's why you'll see a slightly better chance of a shower or storm as we get into Sunday. After that, heat high moves back in over Texas. That's going to cut off our rain chances and bring our temperatures back into the upper 90. So we'll see how, how much more rain we can squeeze out this week, and it would be nice to get a little more rain out there. So 20% chance of a shower tonight, 72. Your morning low temperature up to 93 tomorrow afternoon. There's that chance of an isolated shower or non-severe storm through the course of the day. 30% chance of a thunder shower on Sunday. After that, very, very summer-like. Plenty of sunshine and high temperatures rapidly climbing back into the upper 90s. Guys. All right. Thanks so much, Katie. All right. We now know who the Spurs will play 
when they hopefully tip off again. They are looking to tip off on July 31st, and we do have a game right here on KSAT 12 involving the Spurs as well on the restart. When we come back, the Spurs reopen schedule is unveiled. We'll have that for you, and we have an exclusive with the champ coming up. The NBA has announced that 16 players out of 302 tested this week have come back positive for the coronavirus. That was announced by the NBA and the NBA Players Association today. Any player who tested positive will remain in self-isolation until he satisfies public health protocols for discontinuing his isolation and has been cleared by a physician. Players who are part of that 22-team restart reported to their team starting on Monday and had to be tested for COVID-19. NBA Commissioner Adam Silver held a conference call this afternoon as the league prepares to reopen in Florida where the coronavirus cases have surge and he admitted that while we are left with no choice but to learn to live with the virus no options are risk-free right now he also added that the closed campus environment at disney world is the best option available for the league right now silver addressed two major concerns rapid rise of covid 19 in florida the possibility of getting an infection in the bubble environment my ultimate conclusion is that we we can't outrun the virus and that this is what we're going to be living with for the foreseeable future. We're, we're, we're never going to say that there, there, there's nothing that would cause us to change our plans. You know, one, one thing we're learning with this virus is so much is unpredictable. So, you know, we, we will, we're not saying full steam ahead no matter what happens. We're going to see how this continues to play out, but we feel very comfortable right now with where we are. All right, also on the conference call today, NBA Players Association President Chris Paul, the Oklahoma City Thunder, Miami Heat Ford, Andre Iguodala, who both, by the way, say they are aware of the risk involved in the restart, but are working with the league to minimize them to help bring the sport back. If we're going to be safe, then let's play. If the league, if my fellow brothers in the NBA want to go out and play, I'm with playing. I know my teammates, they want to go hoop, so I'm with my team to go hoop. Do I think necessarily it's the safest thing? No, like that's just straight up and down. I don't think it's the safest thing. When you look around the world, the cases continue to rise. But that's also on the NBA to make sure we're in a safe environment. All right, NBA players will begin arriving in Orlando, Florida for the resumption of the season of the Wide World of Sports Complex at Disney World July the 7th. The Spurs are set to arrive July 9th. We'll be staying at the Yacht Club today. The NBA and NBA Players Association jointly announced a comprehensive plan to restart the season on July 30th. It includes stringent health and safety protocols, makes the arena, the field house, the Visa Athletic Center, the venues for all games with no fans. Each team will play eight seeding games, including the Spurs, who right now are four games out of the eighth and final playoff spot in the Western Conference and trying to keep their 22 seed season streak of making the postseason lie. Here's a look at their schedule. They'll open on July 31st. That will be against Sacramento 7 p.m. followed by Sunday, August the 2nd. Memphis at 3 p.m. August the 3rd. Philadelphia at 7. August the 5th. Wednesday against Denver in the afternoon, by the way, on a Wednesday at 3. At noon on a Friday and August the 7th against Utah. Then against New Orleans. This will be live on Case at 12 Sunday on August the 9th at 2 p.m. August the 11th. Tuesday against Houston at 1. And they'll wrap it up on August the 13th against Utah all that time to be determined. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Former Bears, now Dallas Cowboys safety, HaHa ha Clinton Dix had a close encounter with two Bears outside of his home. Clinton Dix, who signed a one-year $3.75 million contract with the Cowboys, was outside his home on a scooter when a security camera footage caught his encounter with Mama Bear and a Cub and then showed off his lightning speed that makes him a closer on defense. His new teammate, Cowboys running back Ezekiel Elliott, had this reaction. If you know football, if you've played football before and you've seen the way he flipped his hips and ran away so fast, you know, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a pro DB. <laughs> <laughs> Denny McCarthy has begun the latest PGA player to withdraw from the Travelers Championship after he told the Golf Channel he tested positive for the coronavirus, also withdrawing from the tournament, his first round playing partner, Bud Cauley, an exclusive with the city's newest world boxing champion. Next. All right, so champ, how's that sound now after a few days, champ? Feels good. It's a good feeling knowing that I'm, um, I'm a world champion. He's the fifth world boxing champion to come out of San Antonio after winning the WBA Super Flyweight title Tuesday night in Las Vegas. Now Joshua Franco sits down with our own Larry Ramirez this Sunday night on Instant Replay.
How did you get the El Professor nickname? It was from uh, when I first met up with Robert Garcia. When I went to Oxnard to meet up with him, one of his assistant coaches had seen me walk in the gym, and I was wearing my glasses with like a collar shirt and some Sperry's and you know some jeans. And mm -hmm. and he asked if I was a fighter, and I said, Yeah. He started laughing at me. He was like, You don't look like a fighter. He said, You look like a, a per like you could be professor or like a teacher or something. And everybody started laughing. And ever since then, you know, just the professor stuck with me. They they kind of kept calling me that. <laughs> All right, Larry actually did the interview at Joshua's grandmother's home on the city's west side. You can see it all this Sunday night on Instant Replay right after the night beat. Welcome home, champ, and isn't that Congrats. a great yes. picture? Well, an El Professor makes sense since, you know, it's called the sweet science, so there you go. Well done. Thank you. Well done. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Greg. We'll be right back. As we mentioned earlier in the newscast, a doctor at University Health System volunteered to put herself on a ventilator. Frustrated by what she was seeing in the community, the doctor became the patient. She says the goal was to help change people's perspective on what it really is like to be on a ventilator. But while doing this experiment, her perspective changed. Chief Executive Nurse Dr. Tommy Austin showed the entire process live from the IVs to the tube down the throat. Here's that full interview as part of our KSAT Q&A. Why did you decide to do what you did today? Well, you know, I'd heard a, a lot of information where people were making wearing a mask uh, a political issue. And I just wanted to demonstrate to everyone that wearing a mask was, had nothing to do with politics, um, that uh, truly, if you do not wear a mask, that uh, being intubated or being placed on a ventilator is, is an option uh, if you should get COVID-19. And so I wanted people to see how, uh, how difficult it is. And I wanted to experience it myself because, you know, I see these patients laying in the beds on ventilators and I just can't imagine being strapped in a bed, hooked up to several machines and cannot move. And so uh, if nothing else, it gave me more empathy for the patients that I see that I round on every day. Did it hurt? Uh, it didn't feel good. <laughs> it did not feel good. What was the experience like? Um, I, I felt a lot of, of uh, loss of control. And, and although the experience of having the two placed in was not, was not a good experience, the loss of control to me was the, was the bigger issue. What do you mean loss of control? Like it, they basically had to paralyze. Because you're, 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 you're uh, in the bed, they're, they've got you tied to this machine, you cannot move, you're scared that it might dislodge. And so for, my, so for me, my psyche was thinking, well, what if the machine turns off? You know, so uh, I can imagine a patient who uh, would be wondering, what if the power went out? You know, I would be thinking all those negative things uh, as someone who was in that bed on a ventilator. You know, there are a lot of people who wouldn't have done what you just did. <laughs> I know, but I'm not, I'm not everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, so so what, what is happening in your hospital right now? I mean, what is the situation where you're at? Well, we have uh, two floors with the, that have been designated as COVID floors, and we have, uh, you know, reduced the number of elective surgeries that we have, and so we're even looking at a third floor for med surge patients, so that we can uh, play uh, develop an, a third floor for COVID patients, and so uh, we've we've seen an uh, influx from what we had before, so. We might have averaged about 20 or more patients, and now we're four times, almost five times that amount of patients. And it's really sad to see because we're seeing patients from young, 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 meaning days old, to uh, centurions. So, you know, it, it's, it's very hard to see uh, young, old, whomever, uh, with COVID knowing the side effects, and then there's long-term long -term risk of having COVID as well with your lungs and things of that nature. So it's just a, a sad situation that we know that can be pre prevented if we follow those three things that the uh, CDC has told us we need to do. Right, mass, social distancing, wash your hands. And high end hygiene. Yeah, talk about uh, what you hope people take from what you did on Facebook today. Well, what I hope people take 
uh, from Facebook uh, is that no matter what your political affiliation or what you believe, that this is real. It's not a hoax. That uh, you know, it's very serious. That to take some self-reflection and say, uh, is it really worth me not wearing a mask that I might infect someone else? Because you know, we have a lot of people who are asymptomatic. So I could be asymptomatic. I don't wear a mask, and I'm spreading it to everybody else around me. So I would hope that someone would say, "Let me step back. Let me not just think of myself. Let me put on that mask." It's, it's not killing me to put on, put on the mask, um, but if I don't put on a mask and I develop this disease, here is what could happen to me. And that's that being placed on the ventilator. Wow. Dr. Tommy Austin. Tommy says she is thankful for the simulation staff who helped her pull off the experiment. And just to give you an idea of how drastic the number of COVID-19 patients on ventilators have changed, take a look at this graph here. A month ago today, only 19 patients were on ventilators. Just two weeks ago, on June 12, 26 patients were on ventilators. And as of today, 117 patients are currently on ventilators. We'll be right back. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. The European Union set to ban most Americans along with other countries ravaged by COVID-19 in a new travel advisory that could possibly be implemented in just a few days. This as the U.S. hits a record high for the third straight day with more than 44,000 new cases reported today. ABC's Rena Roy has the story. Tonight, ABC News has learned most Americans may soon be prohibited from stepping foot on European soil. The European Union assembling a list of countries, including the U.S., whose citizens will be banned from non-essential travel due to high infection rates. The list, pending final approval, could go into effect July 1st. This, as Vice President Mike Pence painted a positive picture today during the first White House Coronavirus Task Force briefing in nearly two months. Nearly 75,000 Americans have been killed by COVID-19 since. All 50 states and territories across this country are, are opening up safely and responsibly. President Trump's top health advisor, Dr. Anthony Fauci, warning otherwise. We are facing a serious problem in certain areas. And the numbers show it. At least 29 states seeing a rise in cases. In Florida, nearly 9,000 new cases in the past 24 hours. Texas with almost 6,000 cases. Both states now forcing bars to shut down. Today, we find ourselves careening toward a catastrophic and unsustainable situation. The governor of Texas also reducing restaurant capacity a day after halting the next phase of reopening. 23 states are facing an increase in hospitalizations. In Dallas, ICUs over 70 percent full. I need you to put your mask on. I need you to help me. That's how you can help me. New Mexico, San Francisco, and Arizona also pressing pause on reopening. One of the largest hospitals in Arizona activating surge plans to handle COVID cases. We have a wildfire that's out of control. Health experts have been pleading with Americans to avoid large crowds and to keep social distancing. But when pressed on recent campaign rallies, Vice President Pence defended the mass gatherings, saying Americans should not have to forfeit their constitutional rights to freedom of speech, even in a health crisis. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. A two billion COVID-19 vaccine doses by the end of 2021. That's what the World Health Organization is working toward delivering. The hope of vaccine will be delivered to people across the globe with about half of those doses expected to go to low and middle income countries. The new goal is part of a program launched in April that's comprised of four pillars focused on COVID-19 tests, treatments, vaccines and health systems. WHO says only a small portion of the world's population has developed natural immunity to the virus. The organization says cost to deliver tests, therapeutics and vaccines 
estimated at more than $31 billion. Federal officials trying to get the word out. No need to feel leery at the grocery store. The USDA and the FDA released a statement saying people can't contract the coronavirus from food or food packaging. Agriculture Secretary uh, Sonny Perdue and FDA Commissioner Stephen Hahn both say food producers, processors, and regulators are taking every necessary precaution to prioritize food safety. The statement adds that the U.S. is the global leader in ensuring food products are secure for consumption. Facebook says it will ban ads that claim immigrants, racial minorities, or other groups are a threat to others. CEO Mark Zuckerberg announced the new policy today. He says it applies to race, ethnicity, national origin, religious affiliation, caste, sexual orientation, gender identity, or immigration status. Facebook under criticism for posting such ads. Its stock plunged on Friday when major advertiser Unilever pulled out of both Facebook and its other site Instagram because of such ads they saw there. Speak up and save a life. A crucial conversation about domestic violence happening this afternoon. Yeah, KSAT hosted a public town hall event in partnership with the San Antonio Metro Health District. The hour long event highlighted the largest collaborative response to Bear County's serious domestic violence problem. Our Courtney Friedman was joined by six panelists from various backgrounds who answered questions about the many forms of domestic violence, resources available, the effect of the pandemic, and what family, friends, and coworkers can do to help survivors and victims. Take a look. by talking about the most basic information when it comes to domestic violence, and that's often the least understood. The fact that domestic violence is not just physical. There are many forms of domestic violence. Sort of a whole spectrum of behaviors that are designed to control the victim. So a lot of times we see um, gaslighting, which is making the victim feel like she's crazy or that she blame for the abuse, that nobody will believe her if she calls for help. We see a lot of emotional and verbal abuse, calling names, um, using the children to control the victim. Um, in January, the city of San Antonio awarded funds to the Bear County Family Justice Center to expand the response for high risk protective orders. So can you just uh, explain those risk factors and what will those funds be used for? That money, we've been able to expand the staff to include an additional lawyer, uh, funding for an advocate, and funding for an, ab uh, an investigator. So it allows us to even provide more attention on these cases so that we can expedite them. Child abuse is domestic violence. A lot of times um, our community terms them as two separate issues and that's become the norm. We're trying to break that by explaining that child abuse and domestic violence are one and the same. So if a child is witnessing violence, um, then this does create trauma within that child. It also creates an environment where they may believe that that is appropriate or an okay way for people to be treated. We're talking about COVID-19. What trends have you been seeing when it comes to COVID, if any? So when the year started, uh, you know, life before COVID, we were still up about 20% in terms of the calls we were getting for domestic violence. And then as soon as the stay-at-home orders went into effect, I mean, we had a pretty quick and sudden drop. And we were looking at probably about 13% drop in our total calls for service. We've talked about this in multiple stories that I've done with a couple of you here on uh, on this panel about the gaps when it comes to health care. There are so many sectors doing incredible work, but the communication tends to be lacking at certain times. We've been working with the university health system to create a referral system that our health care workers can use uh, when they uh, are introduced to these victims in the system and they can connect them with uh, advocacy individuals who can help them identify high risk individuals and help them navigate the necessary agencies. We've talked many times recently just about how this conversation is continuing. Do you think that the domestic violence conversation has changed just in the past year? Is one that there's been really impressive, continuous, ongoing engagement. I know all of the folks that are on this call and all the agencies they, rec they represent have been uh, very actively engaged as in meaning that we talk almost every week about how we can move things forward. So much more to unpack from today's town hall and we posted the entire event for you to watch right now 
at ksat.com. There you're going to find helpful resources as well that you or someone you know may be seeking, including those on your screen right now. Turning now to weather, let's take a live look outside with live cam 76 degrees out there. Katie, looking forward to the weekend. Yes, it's going to be hotter this weekend. A lot of us were treated to a slightly cooler but still humid day today, but we'll see more sunshine as we get into the weekend and that will help to boost our temperatures. I did want to share a few KSAC Connect photos uh, from some of your views today. In New Braunfels rain is coming there. Yes, you can see it on the left side of that picture there. Some nice heavy downpours at times today. The view in Canyon Lake this afternoon with some rain showers moving through and wrapped up the day with a nice rainbow there in Kerrville. Thank you for your KSAC Connect picture. So while a lot of us saw plenty of cloud cover today and high temperatures limited to the low to mid 80s in some spots, not all of us were so fortunate. Well off to the west of 35, there was a lot more sunshine today and not so much rain. So high temperatures made it into the 90s in places like Carrizo Springs and Del Rio. Overnight tonight, temperatures will be a bit more uniform. We'll all see temperatures fall into the low to mid 70s. It'll be very muggy. Skies will be mostly cloudy and a few lingering showers will be possible as well. Tomorrow, more sunshine than what we saw today and that boosts temperatures back into the 90s. Low to mid 90s here in San Antonio. Some mid to upper 90s off to the west, upper 80s in the hill country on your Saturday afternoon. So a hot summer day, but a good day to get by the pool tomorrow. Find somewhere cool. Doppler radar tonight, not too active. We did have another batch of showers and non severe storms moving in from the south, but as I kind of pause the view at the current time, not a whole lot to see on radar. These showers have been fizzling as they've been new moving north and west, and we do have some showers there. Uh, looks like Del Rio, it's going to miss you just off to the west. These have a little northwesterly movement to them uh, down along the 281 and I-37 corridors there, a little bit of lingering rain there, but that is fizzling out. We had a quick moving shower move through San Antonio and Bear County since the last time we talked last half hour that darted through the center of town there. Now it looks like there's a few sprinkles remaining up near Holotas, but that tiny shower will continue to fizzle out as it moves north. So tonight cloudy, muggy, and we'll start you off in the low 70s tomorrow morning up to the mid 90s, low to mid 90s tomorrow afternoon. And I think you'll notice with some more sun tomorrow, a bit more of that Saharan dust in the air that'll give things a hazy look on Saturday and even the as we get into Sunday. So I, I do want to loop you through uh, our Saharan dust model here um, and let you know how long this is going to hang around. So it really moved in last night, was with us today, and it could be dense at times when you when you look in the horizon uh, as we get into the day tomorrow. As we get into Sunday, good news, it should start to thin out a bit and that trend will continue into Monday. So a little bit hazy at times this weekend, but then we'll get that dust to thin out a bit by early next week. Now, as that happens, Upper level high pressure moves back in that drops our rain chances and brings our temperatures back into the upper 90s. Guys, just in time for the 4th of July, I guess. Oh, yeah, it's timely. Be the 4th without <laughs> yeah. some sweat. It's so. timely. All right. Thank you, Katie. Uh -huh. We'll be right back. The biggest spike of COVID-19 cases hit Bear County this week. And now the phases to reopen Texas are halted by Governor Greg Abbott. This week also saw the mask mandate in Bear County, which was not easy for some to follow. Here's tonight's night, Bre night beat in review. Dramatic rise in cases over the last week is indeed a cause for concern. So starting today, Judge Wolf and I will be back Monday through Friday providing updates from the city and the county's effort to contain COVID-19 in San Antonio. Businesses in Bear County are adjusting to Judge Nelson Wolf's executive order requiring face masks, which went into effect today. We're always going to have a very small percentage of customers that don't want to wear the mask. Um, we, we, we had a meeting on Saturday with my staff on how to handle that. Bear Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf says deputies visited about 80 to 100 establishments today to educate business owners about the new mask order. Northwest Side was one of 17 bars and restaurants in the state, which had its alcohol permit suspended for 30 days. Burn House was found to be among those businesses not following protocol, slow the spread that is of COVID-19. Governor Greg Abbott is expanding some authority for Texas mayors and county judges and paving the way for new executive orders. Previously in Imposed restrictions have been applied to outdoor gatherings of more than 500 people, but local leaders will now have the power to reduce that number to 100. Heated emotions played out on camera after a customer was told to wear a mask. It happened at a Lowe's on I-10 and Callahan, where Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf tried to intervene. He says after he tried to give the man his card, 
it was smacked away. You see it right there. Meanwhile, Judge Wolf faced questions about a claim that he was not wearing a mask after eating at a local restaurant. As I was getting up to leave, somebody was next to me and said something. Well, I hadn't pulled my mask up yet. You know, I probably should have pulled it up uh, right away, but uh, I didn't. It was a moment to remember the fallen. 53-year-old Timothy De La Fuente. He passed away in April due to complications from the coronavirus. If former Harlem Globetrotter Jay Middleton grateful to be alive after receiving life-saving surgery in San Antonio at Methodist Hospital. At seven foot four, Middleton, better known as Stretch, never thought he would suffer from a heart condition. Back in March, he was taken to Methodist where doctors discovered fluid in his heart. Methodist officials say his life was saved thanks to the fast response from the aortic surgeon nearby. Middleton says whether he continues to play basketball or not, he will not take anything for granted anymore. A five-year-old double amputee in England has raised over a million dollars for Evelina London Children's Hospital by walking 10 kilometers throughout June on brand new prosthetic legs and crutches. Tony Hodgel had to have both legs amputated after suffering injuries as a baby. After watching a man who is 100 years old raise millions by walking laps in his garden, Hodgel says he wanted to do the same for the hospital that helped save his life. Good That's job. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So sweet. Go, cool guy. All right, this weekend it will be hotter than it was today. We're back in the 90s, low in chances of rain the next few days, and then hot and sunny next week. That's it for the night beat. Have a great weekend, everybody. Good night.